All right. I love I love seeing you guys just like chat and just like no care in the world. That's awesome. But today, to, uh, we're going to be in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 14 this morning. And as you, t as you turn there, um, God is good. Amen. Like he, he is loving. Thank you. One person be believes that. Thank you. But in, 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 in all honesty, like we can, in all seriousness, we can truly worship the Lord for his goodness for his faithfulness, and ultimately for his grace. You know, last week we finished our series of studies in the Gospel of John, and we covered, you know, several encounters Jesus had. And we covered Jesus' crucifixion, his resurrection, and lastly we covered Jesus' restoring one of his fellow disciples. And if we were to sum up everything that Jesus came to do, you know, from being born in a manger in Bethlehem to his ascension to the right hand of the Father in, into one word, I believe that one word would be grace. You know, the Bible teaches us that we are saved by grace, that we have received gifts by his grace, and that when we fall, we can enter his throne room to obtain mercy and grace. You know, grace is essentially getting what we don't deserve. And it's mentioned 140 times throughout the Bible. And knowing that, that we are undeserving of God's favor, undeserving to be saved, to be loved, His grace should lead us to a place of repentance, worship, love, and obedience. And you know, I've, I've spoken to, to many of you guys, and, I've know, and I, know, I know many of your guys' background, how you guys came from a very difficult, and some of you from a very dark lifestyle. But the fact that you are here today can only be attributed to God's grace. So today, in, in, in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 14, in this passage, Paul, writing to Pastor Titus, tells Titus three things that grace does. Three things that grace does to a believer. And if you are a note taker, these three things that grace does is that, one, it appeared. Two, it teaches. And three, grace points. So read with me in Titus chapter 2, starting at verse 11. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Pray with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you, God, for allowing us to be here, to be together. And Lord, all that we do, all that, that, that we say, God, that just by being able to breathe can only be attributed by your grace, Lord. And Father, we just, we pray, Lord, that, that, that each, every individual here, Lord, and those online as well may understand your grace, Father. That we are saved by grace, that you love us by your grace, Lord. That it's grace that, that we as Christians, we live by. And Father, I just pray that you teach us tonight. Father, let your heart be revealed and, and, and just uh, be glorified, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, for a Christian, our Christian life begins, is sustained, and ends with grace. It's what keeps us moving. It's what keeps us finishing our race. So if our Christian life is surrounded by grace, well, what is it then? What is grace? You know, in the Bible, grace is defined as unmerited favor, right? God pouring his favor upon the infinitely ill-deserving. 
That's, that would be us. The undeserving. Grace is part of God's attribute. It's who he is, and his demonstration of grace is his activity. It is how man is saved. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 tells us, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest, lest anyone should boast. If we could be saved by works, then there would be no need for grace. Romans 11.6 says, If by grace, then is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. And it is this grace that we can see from Genesis all the way to Revelation. We see it when man first sinned to when Jesus comes and establishes his kingdom. In the Old Testament, God demonstrated his grace in a number of ways. In Genesis, we see uh, God showing grace to Noah, not, al not allowing him nor his family to go through the flood. Noah wasn't a perfect man. Noah was just as sinful as everyone else. But by, by God's grace, God saved him from that. God also demonstrated his grace to the Israelites by taking them out of, of Egypt and guiding them to a land filled with milk and honey. God also demonstrated his grace by calling many prophets who consider themselves unworthy to proclaim God's word. And lastly, he showed his grace by bringing the Israelites back into their land after that captivity in Babylon. In the New Testament, God demonstrated his grace by appearing. In verse 11, we see that the grace of God, the grace that saves man, has appeared. And it's, it has appeared to all men, not only to the few, to the elite, or to the spiritual, or the poor, but to everyone. And this grace that has appeared, has appeared in a form of a person. You see, when, when God sent Jesus Christ to man, to us, so that the world may be saved through him, God sent his grace. In the town of Bethlehem, laying in a manger, grace has appeared to all men. And the reason Jesus came, the reason grace had to, had to come, was because of sin. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. What is then the result of sin? Death. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. So death was our destiny. Because of our sins, we were on a path to destruction. And I'm not talking about physical death, although it's part of it. But what I am talking about is, is spiritual death, where our spirit will be cast into eternal suffering. And there was nothing that we could do to save ourselves. Not being religious, not having good morals, not self-affirmation or positive thinking could save us from the wrath of God. Because no matter what we do, or what we did in the past to, to stay clean or, or to keep clean, we would still be stained in the eyes of God, corrupt, and we would be punished for it. Galatians 5, 19 to 21, it says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Talk about a strict standard. A standard like this, no one, I mean, no one will be able to enter into the kingdom of God. I mean, probably some of us have, have, have fallen into at least one of these things. Everyone would be doomed to see the wrath of God. But there is good news. You guys like good news? 
I, I personally love good news and I especially like to hear it after the bad news. It just, it just, for some reason, it just, I forget about the bad news. So here's the good news. Roughly over 2,000 years ago, grace appeared in the person of Jesus Christ to save you. Grace appeared to provide a solution to sin and death. Seeing our need to be saved and seeing that no one can be saved by works, God sent his son so that the world may be saved through him. Jesus Christ lived a sinless life for us. He fulfilled the requirements of God, but yet he bore the punishment of a sinful man so that we who were destined to death may find eternal life in the sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, do you guys see the extent of God's grace for you and me? That God's grace is, is unlimited. There are no bounds to his grace. It extends to the point of sending his only begotten son to die in our place. To die for sinful man. I, I, I do hope that you guys understand the depth of this because we don't deserve that. We don't deserve a perfect God to step out of his glory in heaven to come down to this corrupted world and suffer the very wrath of God so that we wouldn't have to. And the only thing that, that we rightfully deserve is punishment. It is death. We rightfully deserve to experience the wrath of God. But God, in his limitless compassion, grace, and love, he sent his son to bring salvation, to take God's punishment, to take God's wrath. Why? Because of his grace. Because of his love for you. And when I reflect on that, all I can do is, is, is cry, honestly. You know, I, there's this popular song that I keep going back to. I, I'm sure all of you guys have heard it. It's called, I Can Only Imagine. You know, where, the, where, where the writer wonders how his reaction will be when he meets Jesus face to face. He says, will I dance for you, Jesus, or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? If I were to be honest... I would literally fall to my knees and cry like a newborn baby once I see Jesus face to face. Because I know that I do not deserve to be in his presence. That my sins, my behavior, my thoughts, my heart tells me I shouldn't be there based on my own actions. But the person who stands in front of me, Jesus Christ, allows me to be in his presence because of his favor for me. Favor that I did nothing to, to receive. And this grace, this, this salvation, guys, will never change nor be taken away from us. And that is why as Christians, we should be living by the grace of God. Because each time we fall short, we can fall and rest on the grace of God. You know, Romans 8, 1 tells us, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Romans 5, 20, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Grace is greater than any sin you can think of. If you think that God can't forgive me, then you are not understanding his grace and his love for you. His grace is so much greater than your sin, guys. And that's why we can come to him in repentance, trusting that he is faithful and just to forgive us. So if God in his abundant mercy and grace doesn't condemn us, then we shouldn't be condemning ourselves or others when they fall short. 
we're not only to receive God's grace, but also pass on his grace. Because we can be so hard on people, can't we? You know, when, when they fall short or, or when they don't meet our, our expectation, when they do something wrong, we can be so quick to judge and condemn and point and, 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 and put them to the side to the point where we forget how God treated us. We can be so quick to give up on them. And the sad thing is, is that I've seen unbelievers more gracious towards others than believers are. And that's why when I reflect on God's grace and how he has treated me with his grace, honestly, I get cut to the heart and to the marrow of my bone. Because when I see how God has treated me, I need to be more gracious with people. Because trust me, I, I'm not only speaking to you guys, I'm speaking to myself as well. Because when I think about how God did not give up on me when I've fallen short and still fall short, how can I not give up and not be gracious towards others? How can I not share the same grace God has shared with me? And guys, this is what we need to impart on others, grace. Will people continue to let us down? Absolutely, yes, they will. But how often have we fallen short of the glory of God and yet he still demonstrates his grace towards us, constantly. And I believe Christians, believers should be the most forgiving and gracious people because we have experienced God's grace, the greatest of all grace. We are to pass on the same grace, the same love, the same compassion, mercy that God has given to us. Now, you may be thinking, well, if God's grace is, is unlimited and he's quick to forgive, does that mean that I can just live however I want? Live all, you know, sin all willy-nilly? No. Absolutely not. If you think that, you're not understanding what grace is and what grace does. Because grace teaches. And that's my second point, that grace is a teacher. Anyone here a teacher? Some of you guys, my mom was a teacher and it was tough. I, I saw how hard it is to be a teacher. Not because of the students, but because she had me. I was, she was, my mom taught me at school a, a couple of times and it wasn't the easiest student for her, unfortunately. But even as a parent, you teach your child. If you're a parent, you are a teacher. And you teach your child what to do and what not to do. Right? You teach them how to behave, how to share, how to speak properly, how to be kind. And you teach them not to be rude, not to talk back, and not to have food fights right, in the kitchen. In the same manner, the same grace that brought salvation to all man is the same grace that teaches us how to live godly lives. To say no to sin and to say yes to Jesus. Grace teaches us how to live in the present age. You see, as Christians, we, we live in the present age, but the grace of God teaches us not to live like it, nor live for this present age. It teaches us to separate ourselves from it. It also teaches us that by the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ, he has made us citizens of heaven and as citizens of heaven, we are to live as such. Grace teaches us to deny those things that are ungodly and worldly lust. The word deny here means to refuse to give or grant, to turn down or to reject. And I don't know if you guys remember, but in the early 90s, there was this anti-drug campaign with the slogan that said, just say no. You know, it was meant to discourage children from en engaging in drugs and from engaging in those things that caused them harm. And in the same way, grace teaches us just say no to sin. Say no to those things that cause harm to our spiritual walk. And we see this example of this denial to sin in the book of Genesis with Joseph. 
you guys know the story, right? He had Potiphar's wife throwing herself at him, practically begging him to lay with her. And what did Joseph do? He denied sin. He ran away from it. He fled from it. Now, why does grace teach us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust? Because as one who received the salvation of God, we have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. We are no longer bound to the grips of sin. But unfortunately, sin is constantly trying to fight its way back, trying to, 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 to take us back into bondage. And the old man, the man who we, were, who we were once were before Christ, is constantly trying to take center stage. You know, the old man is constantly fighting with the new man to come back alive in us. But listen, we have a choice as, as to which man will win. Are we going to deny the old man and live a life that is pleasing to the Lord? Or are we going to embrace the old man and subject our lives to sin again? The choice is ours to make. When we wake up in the morning, we have a choice to deny the old man. When we feel like an argument is brewing up with our spouse, we have a choice to deny the old man. When we go to work, we have a choice to deny the old man. But you know what can influence us to say no to sin? Not the anti-drug campaign, no. What Jesus did on the cross for us. The grace that God has shown us on the cross should cause us to deny and flee from sin. We should be influenced by what God did on the cross to, to pull us out of the destructive life that we lived in. The grace of God should influence us to live lives that are pleasing to the Lord, to live soberly, righteously, and godly. You know, sober here speaks of self-control. It speaks of, of, of a believer's relationship. Now, test, test. All right, cool. All right, so, yeah, so sober speaks of self-control. It speaks of, of, of a believer's relationship with himself. And righteous deals with how we behave and react with one another. It speaks of the relationship that we have with other people. And godly speaks of our relationship with the Lord. But listen, we don't live this kind of lifestyle because we have to because it, it saves us from sin. No, we, we, we do this, we live this lifestyle because of our love for God. John 14, 15, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. The love that we have for God should make us not want to engage in those sinful things again. It should make us not want to go back to our sinful life. Our love for God should make us want to live a, a life that is worthy of our salvation. And as we choose to obey the teachings of God, obey His Word, grace then points us to look up. And then that brings me to my third point. Grace points and it points to our blessed hope. You know, in this passage, Paul talks about the appearance of Jesus Christ in separate occasions. The first, he, he spoke about how grace appeared in the form of Jesus Christ to, to come to die for the sins of the world. The second is when Jesus comes for his church and realize to who grace points. It says that it points to our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is our blessed hope, the hope that grace points to. And I want you guys to, to highlight that because if anyone argues 
that the Bible doesn't say that Jesus is God or that Jesus was a created being, you can point them to Titus 2 and tell them that your Bible says that Jesus is God. The God who came to die for the sins of the world. And it's Jesus, his return that we're looking forward to. That one day Jesus will come for his church and all the suffering, the hardships, the pain and the sorrow will be over, guys. But in the meantime, while we go through trials and hardships, grace points us to our fullness of joy. Psalm 1611 says, in your presence is fullness of joy. You know, when the difficulties of life become too overwhelming, when we are tempted to just drop everything and leave, and when we feel like all is just lost, guys, the grace of God points us to Jesus. And when we look to Jesus, our strength should be renewed, our perspective set right, and our hope in no other. Guys, grace points us to the completion of our redemption. It points us to the reward that was only given to us by grace. A reward that we shouldn't have gotten and a reward that we did nothing to receive. Now you're thinking, well, it's the reward, the crown, the glory. Yes, the eternal life, that's part of a reward. But there's a greater reward that awaits for us. Genesis 1511 tells us that God is our shield and our exceedingly great reward. You see, Christ is our reward. And because as, you know, as the condition of our world gets worse, as the struggles of life become more heavy, we can look ahead and see what awaits for us in Christ Jesus, guys. Knowing that nothing can take this reward away from you. No one can take Christ away from you. Not the enemy, not, not yourself, not your good works or your bad works. Because this reward was given to you by God's unmerited favor. But as we wait and continue to look for the appearing of our Savior, what are we to do now then? Look up and hope, and hope to see the sky open up like a scroll? No, not quite, right? We're not to be like weird weirdos looking up at the sky for no reason. No, Hebrews 10, 24, 25 tells us, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. See, the writer of Hebrews tells us that as we see the return of Christ approaching, we are to consider one another. We are to take care of each other's spiritual walk, encourage one another to love and to do things that please the Lord. As we wait, we are to continue our fellowship, to be in the body of Christ. Not just come to church and then leave. No, but to come and, and truly be in the body, to know your brothers and sisters in Christ so that you may encourage and exhort one another. Because honestly, guys, this is, this, is, this, is the, this is the family that we have. We're all we, what we have. This is the family that God has given us so that we may build each other up and exhort one another to finish the race. You see, we are to be active in our faith as we wait for the Lord. The more the grace points to the appearing of Jesus Christ, the more we should be moving in the body. We are not to wait last minute to do things for Christ. We are not to wait till the last minute to be involved in the body. You know, when, when, when my wife goes out to run errands, she typically leaves, leaves me at home and, and leaves me a list of things to do. It's not quite the, 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 the relaxation I expected to have, but... She tells me to, to you know, you, uh, you know, before I come, can you pass the vacuum? Can you wash the dishes, take out the trash, you know? And I'm like, don't worry, babe, I got it. I'll do it. Like, just go do your thing. But if I were to be quite honest with you, she doesn't quite know what I do at home. 
I turn on the TV, lay on the couch, and just chill there for a bit. After a couple of movies later, I get a text from my wife letting me know that she's on her way. And guess what? I haven't done anything. I haven't passed the vacuum. I didn't even bother to put the dishes away. So I quickly try to do all of that. Pass the vacuum, take out the trash, wash the dishes. But 90% of the time, she always catches me barely starting my chores. But could I tell my wife, you know, like, I, I, I took your words seriously. I accomplished what, you, what the task that you've given me. Absolutely not. You know, I couldn't. And the same is true as we wait for Christ. Let's not wait to the last minute because we don't know what time he will appear. Let's not have him catch us quickly trying to, to do things for him when we had this all this entire time to do it for him already. Grace keeps pointing us to his return, telling us that he is coming soon. So let's use the time that we have to be in the body, to move in the body, to encourage one another, exhort one another, love one another, forgive and, and be gracious towards one another. And why does grace point us to Jesus? Well, verse 14 tells us why. Because Jesus is the God who gave himself for us. He is the God who died in our place so that we wouldn't. And the reason why Jesus gave himself for us is so that he may redeem us. And redeem has the meaning to, of being purchased, to be set free by paying a price. And what price did Jesus pay for us? Did he use American currency or cryptocurrency? No, absolutely not. He paid it with his life, with his blood. You see, Christ paid for our freedom from sin and death with his very own blood. There was a price that needed to be paid because of our sin. And that price we could not pay. It was just a, a debt that just kept accumulating, accumulating. And there was no end in sight. But dying on the cross, Jesus paid our debt to God. And he set us free from our bondage of sin. Sin is no longer our master, guys. Jesus is now our master. And trust me, he is one great master. Jesus also gave himself for us so that we may be purified, be his own special people. You know, once we accept Jesus Christ uh, as our Lord and Savior, we are saved. We have been purchased and set free from sin and death. But is that all to Christian living? No. Right? We are to be sanctified, purified. And to be sanctified is to be more like Jesus. But realize who it is that is doing the sanctification. Who it is that's, that's doing the purification in the life of a believer. Jesus. He's the one that's doing the work. The task belongs to Jesus and no one else. Not you. Not your spouse. Not your mom or dad or your pastor. But Jesus. And we must remember that because oftentimes we try to be the one who tries to do the changing or the sanctification in another person. But that isn't our job, guys. Our job isn't to change our spouse or our children or to change those around us to be more like Jesus. Because if we try to take that job, we're going to find ourselves being discouraged, disappointed, and exhausted really quickly. Especially when we haven't attained perfect, uh, perfect perfection yet. So what are we to do then? What we can do instead is pray for our spouses. Pray for our children. Pray for those who are around us so that they can allow Christ to work in them and change them from the inside out. We must also be patient with each other. Not be so quick to condemn or, be, or, or, or ex have this expectation that this person should have achieved perfection by now. 
Because we know that we will never be perfect in this world. But we can become more and more like Christ. And for us, we must continue to abide in Christ. Continue to draw near to him and rest upon his heart. Get to know who Jesus is. Get to know and learn so that we may become more like him. And again, we must be patient with ourselves and others as well. Because especially as a young believer, you know, we can beat ourselves up, be discouraged that we just keep falling, keep making mistakes. I remember doing that as a young believer, just kept beating myself up, beating myself up for not being perfect, for not being the perfect Christian. And the reason why is because I wasn't resting in the grace of God. I wasn't resting in the fact that he is working in me and changing me. Does this process take a day, a month, or a year? No, it's a, it's a lifetime process. But trust me, Jesus is and will always work in us, will always change us to be more like him. Philippians 1.6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Each day, Jesus is trimming off those things from our life that are not of him. Things that shouldn't be in our life. You know, think of it as a, as a sculptor. You know, a sculptor doesn't start his work with a perfect statue, right? He, he starts with, with a solid mass of clay. It has no shape. It has no beauty. So what does the sculptor do? He, he, he trims, right? He trims off the excess clay. Little by little, he's giving it shape. He's giving it beauty. You know, sometimes he, he, he trims off a little bit, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there. And times he just takes off a nice huge chunk at a time. And sometimes those huge chunks hurt, don't they? But it takes time to reach the final product. It doesn't take the sculptor a minute to come up with a beautiful statue. It takes hours, days, weeks, and often years. And I was reading an article that this sculptor took four years to complete his work. It's actually pretty nice it was a nice wooden thing that he made but the same is true with christ christ is slowly molding us shaping us removing the excess so that we can look more like him but the process can be slow not because of christ but sometimes because of us you know, we don't allow God to remove those sinful things out of our life. We don't allow him to correct us, to change us. We fight against him. We, we, we hold on to these sins and, and think that it's okay to have them in our lives. That it's okay to think a certain way. That it's okay to, to speak a certain way. Okay to, to treat people a certain way. But guys, if we are to be God's people, if Christ redeemed us to be his own special people, then we can't be serving sin anymore. We can't be making excuses to hold on to sin. We are to be transforming into godly people and people who are eager to do good works. Again, we're not eager to do these good works because it saves us, but because it's a byproduct of our salvation. Good works is a fruit from our salvation. But you know, this, it hit me when, while I was studying this. Because in the times that we live in now, how many of us are eager to do good works? You know, we see all that is happening in our society and our hearts can be hardened to do anything good. We lose the excitement, the, the eagerness to be a light to the world. We become bitter and hard-hearted towards the lost, and may I even say towards each other. We care more about arguing, dividing, and getting our point across than being an example to the world around us. You know, we see that the world is e eager to sin, eager to do bad works, eager to divide, argue, and to hate, 
But guys, we can't allow that to infiltrate not only into our lives, but into the church. Guys, as God's own people, we are to be eager to do good works. And not just in action, but in words as well. Be tender-hearted towards one another. Be, be kind, loving, affectionate. Not only in action, but in word. We are to be God's special people. And I love other translations because it says that we are to be peculiar people. And in some sense, yeah, to the world we are peculiar people. Right? People who, who shouldn't be following the ways of this world. People who don't work according to the ways of this world. And again, we don't do these things to be saved, but we do them because we are saved. We do them because we want to be more like Christ. And guys, all of this is rooted in the grace of God. It's all about grace, guys. Grace and grace alone. When we think that we had enough grace, guess what? God gives us more grace, more favor. John 1.16, it says, And of his fullness we have, we have all received, and grace for grace. This means that Christ is full of grace, and for those who know him, get dunked with more grace. Right? Not, not the ice bucket challenge dunk. We don't want it to be cold, but it's, it's a loving grace that just constantly, it's unlimited, forever flowing upon a believer's life. And everything that we have and get to do for Jesus is because of the grace of God. We don't deserve it. We don't deserve to serve him. We don't even deserve to communicate and pray to him. But it's by his grace that he has shown upon us that he allows us to. That he's given us the opportunity to do so. So rest in his grace, family. Lean on it. Stand on it. Let it be your crutch. Let his grace be the motivating, motivating factor to worship him, to obey him, to love him. And let it be the motivating factor to treat one another with love, compassion, mercy, and to live a life that is worthy of his grace. Remember, our Christian life begins and ends with grace. Amen? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for your grace, God, the grace that you've shown us by sending your son to die on the cross for us, Lord. We are so undeserving of it, Lord. You died for sinners while they were still sinning, God. And Lord, we just forever worship you and forever love you because of it, God. And Lord, as as your special people, zealous, Father God, to do good works. Help us, God, to live by your grace. To not only read about your grace, but to live out your grace. To let it change us. To let it just take its, 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 its root in our hearts and let it overflow out of our lives, Lord. I pray, Father God, that each and every person here just remembers and experiences your grace, the grace that, that you've showered upon each and every one of us, Lord. We love you, Father God. We thank you again for all that you've done for us because just even the air that we breathe, Father, is by your grace, Lord. We love you. We thank you again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.